So the second talk will be given by uh, Jakub. Um, I check from University of uh, Prague. Uh, so he will talk about uh, quantum optimal control and again about uh, non-commutative polynomial optimization. So hello everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, now in this sort of a lockdown mode in Prague, I very fondly remember the warmth of summer, I think 2013, when I first took part in some polynomial optimization workshop in Cambridge. And um, uh, I should like to say that most of the work presented here has been uh, first done in collaboration with EAT Vala and uh, second at IBM Research. So um, in 2012, I joined IBM Research, who are an associate member of OEMA. And uh, I have spent uh, more than seven years there, mostly working on commutative polynomial optimization in power systems. Uh, so if you look up my name in archive, you would find quite a few papers variously using semi-definite programming in power systems. And uh, only in March this year, I have uh, taken up a faculty position in Prague and I still maintain a power systems connection in the sense that I advise a local utility here on optimization. And uh, this is joint work with Yeri Vala, who has spent all his life in quantum uh, technologies and uh, quantum control in particular. Um, he has uh, done his PhD at Hebrew University, then spent several years at Berkeley, and is now part-time at Menu and part-time at uh, IBM Research. And um, so this has been a very pleasant joint work with you. And uh, so in, in, in a single sentence, uh, quantum optimal control is the shaping of a laser or microwave pulse so as to optimize some functional of the quantum states involved. And so in some sense, you can think of it as a time expanded variant of the problems in quantum chemistry uh, or similar, which Sabine mentioned in the previous talk. So uh, the, uh, the techniques um, are in some ways similar, but also in some ways uh, more complicated because you need to deal with the notion of time and uh, the notion of non-commutativity in more places. But at the same time, I'll try to convince you that this is perhaps the most exciting application of non-commutative pop um, as of now, because maybe hundreds of millions of people are affected or could benefit from improvements to the quantum optimal control. And while many people may remember me talking about the billions which are at stake in the more efficient solvers or our systems applications, here there is like a whole breadth of commercially important applications. Uh, so um, historically speaking, perhaps the most important applications of quantum optimal control come from chemistry, where since the mid 1980s, uh, people have considered both um, laser spectroscopy, the use of shaping of a laser pulse, uh, so as to gain insights into reaction dynamics, as well as the laser control of chemical reactions 
And um, this um, sort of a figure below is from a rather ambitious paper in 2000 um, in science, which shows what the chemist think you could do um, in terms of the control of chemical reactions. And really their um, hope is that uh, you could run the quantum optimal control, that's the bit where it says algorithm, and then you could implement it, in this case with uh, a sort of a lasers and some liquid crystal um, uh, means of implementing the optical elements and uh, thereby control the reactions, maybe um, uh, observe the quality of the output and maybe update uh, some parameters. So in principle, you are both uh, learning the Hamiltonian of the quantum system and using the Hamiltonian in the quantum optimal control. And so this way uh, you could even like run this closed loop. The closed loop is obviously very different from the closed loop control you have seen in Sabin's talk, because here all of the measurements are destructive. So you can't have this notion of a feedback control you would have in other settings. But this is huge, right? The sort of a chemistry is huge. Uh, the laser spectroscopy is one small application out of many in chemistry. And uh, while perhaps one of the more mature, uh, you, you would find maybe tens of thousands of citations which deal with laser spectroscopy. And while there are many problems in laser spectroscopy or many challenges, the ultimate um, <laughs> problem it boils down to is the quantum optimal control. If you can improve quantum optimal control, you can improve laser spectroscopy. Similarly, if you could improve quantum optimal control, uh, maybe go into larger systems, uh, you could uh, improve. Uh, and the control of chemical reactions, which would be a uh, um, Our immediate motivation uh, for this uh, comes from quantum computing. Uh, so if you have never seen quantum computing, um, it's an alternative model of computing. Some people believe uh, could uh, produce exponential speed up at certain tasks. And uh, essentially, uh, you will uh, work with qubits instead of bits. And instead of the classical logical operations, you apply uh, unitaries. And in the most basic model, you would apply uh, one and two qubit operations, which are called one and two qubit gates. And uh, in most of these, uh, technical implementations of quantum computing, uh, the implementation of these gates uh, amounts to solving uh, problems in quantum optimal control with either known or maybe partially known Hamiltonian. And uh, so this should give you a feel for this in a very simple setting where you would like to implement a single qubit gate which rotates the quantum state uh, from the basis state of zero to the basis state of one and uh, here on the top left you will find some uh, actual code in uh, Qiskit, uh, an IBM supported open source project which uh, makes it possible to uh, implement such a gate. But obviously this is a very simple pulse, Gaussian pulse, and you could do much more with more broad class of pulses. And uh, really, if you were able to uh, produce better methods for quantum optimal control, you would be able to produce very straightforwardly higher fidelity to qubit gates or maybe even gates of higher rarity, higher fan out and that would be a boon for quantum computing. And finally, and maybe less uh, sort of obviously, much of biology 
um, both micro and um, macro molecular biology uh, is concerned with quantum optimal control or uses quantum optimal control in some ways. Uh, so notably, for instance, if you have some friends who study proteins, uh, they would very likely tell you that uh, they use nuclear magnetic resonance, um, one of the basic techniques in the field for studying large molecules in solution. And uh, in nuclear magnetic resonance, you essentially send some pulse. You need to shape that pulse. The quality of that pulse crucially determines the quality of the image you get on the output or the spectra, which you then somehow process into images. And uh, so if you were able to produce better uh, methods for quantum optimal control, you would be able to uh, produce better resolution images, better resolution spectra in uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. And these are huge fields once again, right? So sort of there are maybe like hundreds of thousands of people who use nuclear magnetic resonance on a daily basis. And um, there would be further uses of magnetic resonance and uh, new imaging, for instance. So this is, this is sort of a large field which um, has substantial community and also commercial value. So at the same time, this quantum optimal control somehow marries a number of fields of mathematics and allows for what I hope at least are quite elegant um, methods. So in the talk here, I will try to touch very briefly on many fields and I obviously can't do justice to any of them. So very much uh, apologies. Uh, if you are a specialist in one of these. But what we are trying to do here is to use numerical analysis, specifically bandwidth expansion, to work with some linear evolution equations. We, then we translate it to non-commutative pop, as that been introduced in the previous talk, where uh, non-commutative pop relies crucially on results uh, from algebra and function analysis. And then in the end, it boils down to some large SDPs and we need to solve them. So once again, after this uh, long winded motivation, uh, quantum optimal control is the shaping of a laser or microwave pulse so as to optimize a function of the states, often under some constraints on the magnitude of the field that you can work with or the magnitude of the pulse you can work with. Um, for two-level systems, for instance, the single qubit gate, you have seen um, the block sphere for on the uh, picture earlier. Um, the problem is essentially solved in the sense that uh, the uh, problem is in vax. So the local and global uh, minima coincide and a lot of the complexity somehow goes away. On the other hand, the solving of problems where you have more than three levels is still in some sense an open problem. Not necessarily in the sense that there wouldn't be thousands of papers, but in the sense that we don't have any perfect method. There are some methods which are practically relevant. And then there are some methods which could have uh, uh, global convergence guarantees. But the method that would both have global convergence guarantees and be practical is still somehow out there. And so um, that's, that's one sort of a part. And the second reason why most of those methods are not globally convergent is that in principle, if the pulse, um, unless the pulse is 
square pulse or some has some very simple structure, the Hamiltonian does not commute with itself at different times. And uh, so you have a whole different notion of uh, non-commutativity entering uh, the problem and you somehow need to deal with it. And most people in the chemistry and, and uh, physics somehow assume the commutativity of Hamiltonian at different times, which doesn't seem quite right. Uh, so that's, um, that's what we'll be looking at. Um, uh, we have a substantial discussion of related work in the paper and archive. So maybe just to sort of uh, explain that there are lots of uh, pre-existing methods. Uh, I should like to say that uh, we essentially here on this slide and on the next slide, we cite papers which have maybe hundreds of citations each. So those are really well known in the field. And uh, these can be grouped into several clusters. On this slide, they would essentially all start with the Pontryagin principle, uh, the first order optimality conditions um, of the optimal control problem, and then apply some uh, techniques from optimization uh, over that. And that could be derivative free optimization, uh, that can be gradient methods, first order methods, that can be quasi Newton methods. On the next slide, uh, these can be sequential convexifications, which are perhaps the closest in spirit uh, to what we do. And uh, we should like to also mention that there are several book length introductions to quantum optimal control. And um, some of them, such as this Djurjevic, and they are really like works of uh, art and uh, labor of love <clears throat> and uh, very much recommended if you uh, like to uh, buy yourself a book for Christmas. Um, so that's the state of the art. Um, now for the formalization of the problem. Uh, so we consider a finite and dimensional system whose time evolution is governed by the Schrodinger equation. We have some initial condition, which could be the unit matrix. We have some terminal time, some time horizon. And uh, we have some target uh, unitary, which we would like to uh, obtain at the terminal time. And so throughout the talk, we'll be comparing this target unitary, uh, which is given to us with uh, the unitary uh, we uh, really get by the linear evolution equation at time t, or some approximation theorem. Um, and our Hamiltonian will be expressly time dependent and uh, non commutative at varying. Uh, points in time. So um, maybe more mathematically speaking, uh, we work uh, with solutions, um, the initial value of the initial value problem for the Schrodinger equation. And uh, we um, would like to write the controls uh, in the in this form. So U would be the controls that control varying parts of the Hamiltonian. In what people call sometimes the standard form, you would have a single control for a single term in the Hamiltonian. Um, in general, you can have maybe more uh, terms control over this way, which is the setup we use here. Um, are there any questions to the set up here. Um, so um, the first 
and essentially the only technical tool I would like to explain in detail here is uh, the Magnus expansion. So a numerical analysis and integration of uh, such uh, equations uh, people have studied for 70 years now, almost 70 years now, uh, the so-called Magnus expansion. And so um, in 1954, Magnus published a paper where he has shown that uh, the solution of the initial value problem can be under certain conditions expressed uh, as the matrix exponential of a sum, which is here called omega. And uh, there is a substantial literature building on this. So this survey by Blaine's in 2009, um, that's maybe 160 pages and gives hundreds of references, right? So what we are uh, doing here in more detail is that um, we uh, use uh, the Magnus expansion, which has a well-known rate of convergence. If you look at equation five, you will essentially see uh, in the sum this um, Bernoulli number uh, divided by the factorial of n, which gives you explicitly the rate of convergence of the Magnus series. And uh, then you will see this um, maybe at first complicated looking construction, which essentially um, involves uh, some multiple integrals involving nested commutators. But um, in some sense, this is something you can compute. Um, uh, okay. And uh, then um, the theorem says that when the series is absolutely convergent, then uh, we have the solution of the initial value problem being equal to the exponent of the sum. Now, the question of when the series is absolutely convergent has been the subject of a substantial number of works. And uh, the most recent uh, papers on the subject which closed that question in some ways were by Moan and Nielsen. Uh, we have the references in the archive version. But essentially, uh, the point is that the convergence is well understood. The conditions for the convergence are well understood. What does this mean for us is that we start with the initial state, uh, which we call u hat at zero, and uh, we have some reachable set of uh, states uh, from that point. And the very surprising, and uh, as far as we can tell, novel observation is that the use of Magnus expansion in this context makes it possible for you to reach uh, many more uh, target states from the initial state by you being able to produce new commutators in the process of applying the Magnus expansion. So the picture on the left, top left, shows that you somehow expand the reachable set by applying the Magnus expansion iteratively. And on the right, there are the first two terms of the Magnus expansion, uh, where uh, the omega one is what people typically use in physics. And, and uh, from the convergence of the Magnus expansion, it's clear that this is not a very bad choice for the starting solution or such like, but that it's not necessarily the correct uh, thing to do. And uh, um, then uh, as you sort of increase uh, the uh, order of the Magnus expansion, you have more and more integrals involving more and more nested commutators. Now, this is a sort of a graphical illustration from Blaine's 
of the uh, rate of convergence of the Magnus expansion. So in black, you have the function you're trying to approximate. In brown, you have some classical perturbation techniques, which don't work particularly well. And uh, here, Magnus 1 to 4 uh, suggests the quality of approximation by the first, second, third, and fourth um, order Magnus expansion. And uh, so you would sort of see that there is a substantial step from the first to the second step, and then eventually you get uh, sort of closer and closer to the correct value um, and the rate of convergence um, obviously decreases. So uh, to, to summarize, we use this Magnus expansion in solving the quantum optimal control problem. The quantum optimal control problem uh, we consider has the following form. So we have some functional, which we assume to be polynomially or semi-definite representative. And uh, we would like uh, the solution to be a solution to the initial value problem uh, with uh, the initial, uh, from starting from some initial point. Um, and so overall, our result could be summarized as follows. So under the assumption of the Magnus expansion um, is absolutely convergent, and we deal with this in more detail in the paper, and the quadratic module being Archimedean, uh, which is, for instance, the case in quantum computing, and which is the case in practical applications, even for instance in the chemistry. Um, then for any initial state and for any target state within the reachable set, possibly expanded by the Magnus expansion, and for any error, um, epsilon, uh, we can construct uh, this sort of a matryoshka uh, model where we first use the Magnus expansion, then uh, build on top of that the uh, um, Navascules-Piron Asin hierarchy, and then uh, use the results of CLEP and others to extract the solution uh, from uh, the SDP relaxation. So, and we sort of show this in the model of loop shoot and smile in order to uh, make things easier in terms of the uh, numerics. So um, I, I would like to now comment first on the exact progression of this Matryoshka construction. Uh, so um, the main steps involved us starting from the quantum optimal control, then using uh, the Magnus expansion uh, to uh, solve the initial value problem. So essentially all solutions of the initial value problem are uh, produced in some form uh, parametrized by the controls such as this. Then we truncate the Magnus expansion at some point. Then we discretize things and uh, we obtain um, this truncated discretized version of the Magnus expansion. And then we can use uh, polynomial optimization and commutative polynomial optimization uh, to uh, obtain first the SDP relaxation and then to extract the solution from the SDP relaxation. Uh, the key to um, in this outside of the Magnus expansion is the non-commutative polynomial optimization, which uh, Sabine has introduced so nicely in the previous talk. And uh, um, though I won't go into much detail here, 
and we really crucially uh, rely on the uh, results of Bironio Navascules fantasy. Now, um, I should like to maybe uh, have several uh, sort of uh, remarks in the margin. So one is the choice of the uh, model of computing. So for us, uh, the use of the uh, Bloom, Schupp and Smell model of computing, which is very nicely introduced in uh, this textbook, uh, uh, I would very much recommend um, if you are interested uh, in such things. Um, mostly for simplicity, because it makes it easy for us to consider uh, that the operations with real numbers are performed in unit time. So sort of the basic arithmetic, such as addition of two real numbers is performed in unit time and not to worry about the introduction of the errors. And that's important because somehow we need to make sure that the uh, errors do not compound as we sort of uh, introduce the several layers of approximation here. But also more recently, uh, there has appeared a paper in the Nature Scientific Reports, uh, which uh, shows that if you consider a digitized version of quantum optimal control, then this digitized version of quantum optimal control is undecidable. And uh, this is uh, really um, a reduction to the results of Matthias Savic on Hilbert's 10 problem. Uh, so um, this is in some ways unavoidable. And uh, while uh, thinking that, for instance, the double uh, a type on a tearing machine or a classical computer is uh, necessarily digitized, maybe going too far. Um, ultimately, this shows that if you take things very um, carefully um, on the tearing model, this uh, quantum optimal control is undecidable. Right. And so uh, it also, I think, is a nice motivation for uh, use of the BSS model uh, more broadly, because if you uh, uh, if you think about uh, polynomials and if you think about uh, tearing machines, you can maybe invoke similar arguments to what Dennis and Sasha had done here and uh, maybe sort of are reduced somehow uh, to this Hilbert and problem. And uh, then I'd like to mention um, again more in, in the margin that we have some very recent joint work with Dennis and Yeti Bala, which approaches quantum optimal control from a very different perspective. And uh, one of those key ingredients here is that we assume that the pulse will be a polynomial. So instead of thinking that the pulse is an arbitrary time series, uh, we here think that the pulse um, is somehow smooth. And from approximation theory, then we have some sort of a polynomial which is close enough. And then uh, the second key ingredient is a, a rather different way of dealing with the non-commutativity, um, which we have addressed in this work, in the main subject of this talk, with the Magnus expansion. And so here we could use this approach uh, rooted in Dyson's work uh, with the time-ordered product of operators uh, to uh, come up with the uh, solution of the initial value problem in a different form. And uh, this has 
substantial advantages in some cases. Notably, it has a much better dependence on the time resolution you consider. So uh, to conclude, we have presented two approaches to quantum optimal control. The first approach, which was the bulk of the talk, um, has been showing the computability of quantum optimal control in the bloom and smell model, in spite of the undecidability of the same problem in the Turing. And so even at that sort of a, a level, I think that that's quite an important result and it crucially utilizes non-commutative pop. So in practice, this has several advantages and in some specific sort of a smaller fields, such as the control of some Hamiltonian uh, involved in the superconducting qubits IBM develops. It helps answer some questions related to the reachable sets where we knew, for instance, that some Hamiltonians uh, are not operator controllable, do not allow to reach all of the target states. But with the Magnus expansion, we add some of the commutators and we uh, regain this operator controllability, for instance. So we sort of uh, can do more with the Magnus expansion. We can have a larger reachable set. And uh, we are able to use this for very high end in the end level systems at very low resolution of time. That need not be a major issue because in the quantum optimal control, people often consider 50 or 100 time steps, even with the present approaches, which are computationally uh, maybe less demanding than the non commutative pop. But at the same time, this is a distinct uh, limitation. So in the second approach, uh, we uh, have a much better dependence on the number of steps in the discretization of time, but uh, we have a much worse dependence on the number of levels. So somehow uh, we envision that if we finalize this at some point, uh, we will have two complementary approaches this way. And uh, speaking of the applications, um, I think that for the quantum computing, we are the biggest boom um, in the short term would be the implementation of higher fidelity two qubit gates. The second approach could be more promising. And we do have. Uh, very promising computational results for the second approach in that setting. Um, more forward looking could be the idea of replacing the whole quantum circuit, the application of the whole quantum circuit with a control signal. And there, the non commutative pop used in the uh, Magnus expansion, as we have seen it uh, today, I think could be the real tool to use. Uh, in biology, the nuclear magnetic resonance often uses a uh, much higher time resolution than the 50 or 100. Um, but in chemistry, the laser control of chemical reactions crucially requires uh, the dependence on the N and the N level system. And so there this Magnus expansion could be maybe preferable. So um, with that, uh, I would like to maybe uh, conclude and uh, give the three key references mentioned. So the, this is the survey of Lenz et al. on Magnus expansion, which introduces it beautifully. This is the uh, paper of uh, Navas Kulespiron and Singh, which has introduced the commutative pop. And this is our draft, uh, which this talk was based on. And I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>
Thank you very much. And I need to talk. Um, so, questions, please feel free to unmute your microphone and ask directly the question. I have, I have one question. Um, <laughs> so you presented a, a serum with some uh, your serum with um, which uh, gives some complexity somehow some complexity analysis. So we have this quantity m of epsilon, which depends on uh, oh, explain right. the, somehow the complexity. Right. So sort of uh, in some ways, uh, this M is uh, just sort of uh, concerned with uh, the um, size of the reachable set, right? So sort of uh, this lower bound um, is only for the uh, reachable set you require. So uh, what, what this uh, lower bound on M says is that um, if you sort of uh, pick some uh, target unitary which is not within the reachable set uh, from the initial point and you need to use the matrix expansion uh, to get to that point uh, you need to use a degree of or the order of the magnus expansion uh, which uh, would be within that uh, which would make the target uh, fall within the uh, Magnus expanded reachable set at the given order. Um, so, yeah. Obviously, the, the, that sort of a, has a, an impact on the complexity. So, sort of at the higher uh, M you pick, the uh, larger will be the degree of the polynomials involved in the non commutative polynomial optimization problem. Uh, but um, so my, my my question is about this m of epsilon. What right. is the, the behavior of uh, yes? What the function uh, of epsilon it is? What kind of function you have here? Right. So if I understand the question correctly, you're asking for how many uh, terms in the uh, Magnus expansion you want to take to get certain error. Yes. Right. So for that, we have a very good answer, right? And that answer is essentially based on this uh, Bernoulli number divided by the uh, n factorial um, sort of a decay in the Magnus expansion. So for that, we have the perfect answer in some sense. Uh, but what you should sort of uh, realize um, is that. Uh, uh, this sort of uh, translates in a rather nasty way to the size of the SDPs. So sort of uh, the Magnus expansion, we, uh, we understand a lot of the convergence of, and we can tell you that uh, when your M of epsilon is, uh, when your epsilon is certain value, then you need a certain number of terms in the Magnus expansion to achieve that. But then there is a sort of a more um, involved uh, sort of a topic of the rate of convergence of the uh, NPA hierarchy uh, for the non-commutative polynomial optimization problem. And while we know that the convergence is finite and so there exists some point where you would uh, have that uh, uh, requisite uh, error, uh, that's sort of a lot harder, and, and in general, it's um, sort of a something where you should expect uh, very large matrices, right? So sort of if you start with Magnus expansion of a certain uh, order, uh, you will have a polynomial of certain degree, and uh, you will need at least uh, that degree halved uh, order of the 
NPA hierarchy. So, um, and, and, and the size of the matrices will be exponential in the uh, degree of the, uh, in the NPA hierarchy. So, so sort of overall, uh, the complexity is substantial, right? So sort of here, we're not trying to say that this is the final answer in terms of practicality. This uh, sort of what can be tried with maybe like degree five uh, polynomials in practice for the two qubit gates. But it's certainly not the case that here you can readily use this um, like more broadly. Right, uh, like I think my, my, my point here was to say that this quantum optimal control is a very important problem and that in theory, there is now a globally convergent approach, which relies on the non-commutative pop. But uh, I think that in practice, there is a scope for a substantial amount of future work uh, before this is a practical method readily applicable to um, like off the shelf. Thank you. Do we have other questions? So may, may I ask a question? Yes, so, please. So may, maybe just in continuation of what you said, just to make sure. So did you implement the method for some small toy problems or? Yes, we have now implementation of both this and uh, the method we hinted here. Um, and uh, for the for the small uh, number of levels, such as in the two qubit gates, we are much happier with the behavior of this method um, than uh, with uh, the behavior of the method based on the Magnus expansion. So here we can really sort of solve from maybe order five, order six, I think at the highest was order 10 relaxations. And uh, uh, we can uh, get results which very sort of neatly uh, converge to the true value where we know the value. And uh, so that somehow gives us a lot of hope in uh, specifically the second approach which also has other benefits. Um, we have, for instance, an extension of this to uh, quantum open systems or open quantum systems where uh, there is some Lindblad super operator and there is some sort of a modeling some noise entering, uh, entering the evolution. And so sort of a, for some reasons, <laughs> uh, this is still uh, not finished but uh, we uh, feel quite positive about this. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have, do we have uh, other questions? Okay, apparently no. So we thank you again for your uh, presentation. We and for the presentation of um, the first presentation of Sabine this morning also. So we we stop here. We have a break lunch, and we will resume at uh, one thirty in the same uh, setting. Thanks, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Have a good lunch.